I'm Chad Evan Collins, and this is the Marketing On Demand Show. I set out to answer the million dollar question. What is the biggest needle mover in your business and what drives people to buy faster than anything else? Through selling over $30 million of my own products and services and setting two Guinness World Records for ticket sales along the way, I discovered how to move the needle consistently and quickly. If you're a marketer, e-commerce seller, entrepreneur, or founder, join me as I reveal my exact strategies and see what today's smartest business leaders are doing right now to explode their sales. Do you want to learn how to boost your sales using these methods? Text the word DEMAND to 90851. That's DEMAND to 90851. Now, here's the show. Hey, it's Chad Evan Collins here, your host of the Marketing On Demand Show, where I've boiled down online marketing into a simple formula that anyone can use. It's a combination of awareness and response-based marketing paired with scourgency, that's scarcity plus urgency, that equals marketing on demand. And I want to send you my marketing on demand method for free. Just visit marketingondemand.com or text method to 90851. Today, we're going to be chatting with Perry Marshall. Let me tell you a little bit about Perry, and then we'll dive into some Q&A. Perry is one of the most expensive business strategists in the world. He is endorsed in Forbes and Inc. Magazine, has guided clients like FanDuel and Infusionsoft from startup to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Even NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs uses his 80-20 curve as a productivity tool and his reinvention of the Pareto Principle is published in Harvard Business Review. His best-selling books include 80-20 Sales and Marketing and his ultimate guides to Facebook ads and Google ads and more laid the foundation for the $100 billion pay-per-click industry. Perry, thanks for taking some time to hang out with us here today. Thank you, Chad. Thanks for having me in color, even though you're just in black and white. I, I, that's, I've, that's never happened to me before. Are, are, maybe, are you from a 1960s Cary Graham movie? I know. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a throwback. I'm a throwback. Uh, so, so I want to I wanna dive right in because I know you have a background in electrical engineering. And what I'm most curious about is how does one with a background in electrical engineering find their way into the world of online marketing, whether it be copywriting, whether it be pay-per-click. Tell me what that, what was that moment in your life where you decided, you know what, I'm diving all the way in on this side. Well, I, I think there were, there were three moments. Moment one was when my friend recruited me into Amway when I was 21. Okay. Which started to introduce me to the dark side. Uh, moment number two was when my, this is about five years later, my wife got, got pregnant with our first child. And then I got laid off from my job in my engineering job. And if I was going to stay in engineering, it turned out I was going to have to move. And so I went into sales instead. So I didn't could stay in Chicago. And then that was two years of bologna sandwiches and rum and soup. And that I would say the third step was, I was fixing to get fired from my job. I'd worked there for a year and a half. Um, my sales was terrible. Our credit card debt was spiraling upward. You know, my wife is at home with this little baby hoping, I'm hoping that she's not going to have to get a job or something. Like you get into some really grim choices, you know, when you get far enough down that road, right? And I stumbled into a a seminar where Dan Kennedy was the last guy to speak and he levitated 300 bucks out of my wallet and I bought yeah. a magnetic marketing kit. Um, and then I guess maybe to put the cherry on the Sunday, um, when I got fired from my job, I quickly got a new job. It was a, another sales and marketing job, but this company had a website in 1997 and and I was like, I'm reading now. Dan Kennedy was not talking about the internet at all yet, but I I'm reading this these newsletters and stuff, and I'm going, 
you know, I'm pretty sure a website is an awful lot like a sales letter. Um, nobody's said so, but I think I'm going to make that connection. And I think like everything that you do over there, just let's apply it over here. And that, so I, how's that? Does that make any sort of sense out of, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it does. I think we all have friends that have tried to bring us to an Amway meeting. I actually have a funny story about that, that maybe I'll share one of these days. Um, and then, and then you round it off with Dan Kennedy, uh, how he was able to uh, get you to purchase a program that he's had, but then that opened your eyes to what really was possible online. Yes. Um, so, yeah. so yeah, I think we get that. Now, once you knew that, okay, I could take, I could take these things that I'm learning from Dan from, I guess at that point it was, was it mostly copywriting standpoint? Is that what you were? Yeah, it was, about? it was, it was copywriting and kind of the gorilla attitude and certainly some information about how to use the media. Right. And, and stuff like that. So um, it all for me um, would mean that you started to have success with it at, at yes. some level, yes. right? Because without having success at some level, then you might throw it all away and say, you know, yeah, what, what have I done here? Uh, how can I get my $300 back? Um, what was that for success then? Um, so, so the first, <laughs> the, the first thing was one of the things that Dan said that got me to buy was he said an Amway distributor had done this and I was getting to the end of the of two roads, not one. I was getting to the end of the Amway road and the end of my sales job road and it was getting really bumpy. And so I think the, so, so I was like, all right, I have this problem, which I, I, there's not enough people to go meet with and I have to chase them down. And I was prospecting. I mean, it was just the most antiquated like thing in the world. And, 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 and he's saying you could use direct response advertising to make any of these businesses work. And so I wrote a sales letter for my MLM stuff and I was actually getting appointments, but the appointments were costing me like, I don't know, 50 bucks of media or something to get an appointment. And I cashed in a critique coupon and I sent it in to Dan. And Dan, Dan said, you know, you, you haven't actually done too badly considering that nobody's laying awake at night trying to get what you've got. Okay, like your numbers are actually okay. And that was a rose colored glasses shattering because what I had really done is they told me, so I had moved to Chicago a couple of years before. I didn't really have a friend network. So I had to go meet people. And so I was doing the hardest way you could possibly try to do MLM to go around and meet people and stuff like that. And so what Dan taught me to do is convert that to stick money in a box and pull a lever and then get a result out like all direct response marketing is. And when I did that, I suddenly realized that the economics are impossible. It was like, so if you convert your time to money and you go invest the money, you'll never get a, enough money back to make it worth the time. This thing is not scalable and it's not economically viable. And I suddenly realized that it was fool's gold. Well, then I, I, I got a job at this at this company and we started working with the website and we started getting leads coming in. And I experienced something that I had never experienced before, which was an email comes in, somebody wants me to call them. I call them. They're actually happy to talk to me, which was better than any form of therapy because like, I, I won't even <laughs> go in to how emotionally damaged I had become by doing all this crap and getting nothing but rejection and refusal. And, and, and so I, my first commission check, it was like the most money I'd ever made. I think I made like $4,500 in a month or something like that. And, and, and man, like I, I couldn't get enough. Yeah. You know, I was going to, I thought we were going to wait till a little bit longer to start talking about copywriting. Um, <laughs> But I'm happy we're talking about it now because 
the question I have for you is there could be two, um, two companies that offer the exact same product or service. They're after the exact same uh, ideal customer. Um, so they seemingly offer the same thing. The one attracts their perfect customer and does lots of business and they're happy. And the other repels their, their customer, mm. right? Um, how important is it is the copy in your marketing message? Well, it's the second most important thing. Um, so, the, well, the, the most important thing is the audience. Um, and you have audience copy offer, and I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm getting in this backwards. You could make arguments for, you know, I, I would say the audience is the most important thing. So I, I would agree. Who, who, start with, start with audience, who, yep. You build an offer or you start with an offer and you find an audience but either way, if the offer doesn't match the audience, you are totally, totally screwed. Now, in my, in my opinion, the copy, any discussion of copy presumes that you have the offer right in the first place. Because if, if you have a wrong offer and you fix it with copy, you're lying. <laughs> right? Right? So, oh yeah, soccer mom, this is for you. And it's actually for 22 year old skateboard guys, right? Like, so, um, so, well, okay. So let's go back to your question and make sure that I'm dialing this in. Yeah. So, so the, so the question is how can, how can one company's, let's stick with copy. How can one company's copy repel the same audience that they're trying to attract while the other company attracts that audience. Now they're both serving their, their ads, the same exact audience. They both have the perfect service. One's winning, one's actually like making people run away. Yeah, okay, so here's an example. So let's say they, they both got a great offer and they both got the right audience. Let's say the audience is dentists and let's say the copywriter refers to MDs as real doctors. Well, that's all it would take to completely piss off the dentists because even though, I mean, I'm not going to get in an argument about whether a dentist is a real doctor or not. It's just that a smart copywriter wouldn't even touch. They would just presume, you know, you guys are all doctors, right? And so like you can have the tiniest little thing wrong. Okay. And, and, you know, people calibrate to language like, okay, so, so Chad, what's the first thing that you think of when I say precious? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Precious. Um, like, yeah. Oh, oh, that's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Right. Like that's gone. Thank you. Right. I, can, I needed the, vi I needed the visual Perry. Like, well, <laughs> all it took was one word and a little like, Right, wiggle a little finger motion, and you're like, "Oh, got it." Okay, you have to realize that if you're doing niche marketing correctly, which is the only thing inexperienced marketers should ever try to do. By the way, I don't think inexperienced marketers should ever just try to sell the unwashed masses. That's a recipe for suicide. You you should tune into your audience that fast, like literally within one or two sentences, they know, okay, he's one of us and he's talking to me. Okay. And I think, I think that is the most important thing about copy. And then if you can keep it going and it, and, and they keep going, he's one of us, he's talking to me. He's one of us. He's talking to me then you got it. You know, when it comes to pricing and being able to charge maybe more than you think you're getting right now, mm -hmm. um, there's often a psychological roadblock in business owners that don't think they could charge a premium for a particular service. And oftentimes I believe that comes from a place of, well, I know as business owner that 
said customer can go somewhere else for something similar for a lower price, right? There's always the cheaper alternative, right? That, that, the, that even the business owner sometimes thinks can get them the same result that I could get them, right? Yeah. And that belief system often hinders the upside the, 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 the upside potential of the product or service they, they're offering to their customers that love them. And what I've, what I've said sometimes is that people are choosing to do business with other people. So if someone is in, is in my world or someone is in your world, Perry, um, and, you make, and you make them an offer and it's very similar to, to an offer that they get somewhere else, they're happy to pay the Perry price because they're getting Perry because they're choosing to do business with you. They're choosing to um, tap into the resources that you have that while, while they might be able to get something very similar somewhere else. And, and the same is true for me or, or a million other things. When you're talking with, with business owners, how do you help them get over that hurdle and help them charge what, what they rightfully deserve? So if I'm selling paper towels, I commodity. Don't- I don't think there's a good answer, (laughs) okay? But I just even from your question, um, I think you're you're talking uh, especially to people who coach, teach, speak, authors, subject matter experts. And so I'll tell you a story about that. So one time I was uh, spending a weekend with my brother-in-law he is a guru of some repute of jazz mandolin. Pretty narrow niche, right? Um, he owns a music store. And my sister, married to him, older than me, she thinks I'm just a stupid punk. Um, <clears throat> she goes, she, 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 she constantly refers to his customers as these minions who like give him money for some strange reason. <laughs> and I said, Ted, listen to me. <clears throat> and and he, he, he had been explaining to me because I was really curious, like, okay, so like, what's your platform? What are you actually teaching these people? And there's all these fingering techniques and all this stuff, like we lay the foundation and then it enables to do the next thing and the next thing. And, and I'm like, okay, yeah, got it. Got, I, like so I can connect the dots from his world to my world. I said, listen, if somebody stumbles into your world and learns jazz mandolin the way you teach it with your phraseology and your lingo and your fingering techniques and your method and your, your progression, it's like there's this imprinting that happens It's like, you're the mother duck. They learned this from you and they are dialed into you. They understand your tone of voice. They understand your system, your way of thinking. And from this point forward, you are most likely the most effective teacher that they will be able to find in jazz mandolin for however far you can take them. Now, maybe Bela Fleck can take them farther or maybe... Actually, he's a banjo, right? But you, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's somebody else maybe who can take him farther than you, but most students are never going to do that. And I said, listen, why do they play mandolin? It's because of, for relaxation or a status in the music community, or maybe they have a gig playing in the bars or, or, or whatever, but this is a meaningful thing to them. That's worth money. And Ted... Your people aren't minions and you should never think of them that way. And that is, that is the personality element. And I believe that when, when people, whether you're a man or a woman doing whatever you do, teaching whatever you teach, being an expert on whatever you're an expert on, I believe that what human beings actually get from a mentoring relationship is fathering and mothering. Okay, now, my mom made macaroni and cheese, your mom made macaroni and cheese. 
my mom made sandwiches, your mom made sandwiches, my mom washed the clothes, your mom washed the clothes, but my mom not equal to your mom. And I think that's what you're getting at. And, and, and w- what we're referring to is a personal connection. And by the way, this can happen via media. It could, it could just be you on a YouTube channel, but people, like you're only going to develop mentoring relationships with so many people. We don't have an infinite amount of bandwidth to go plug our umbilical cord into an infinite number of people. Okay. And so once you've started to develop a relationship with people, even if it's purely just listening to your podcast and you've never met them, that's still a relationship. It's a totally asymmetrical relationship. But, but you don't discount that. Um, and, and, you know, just th- this is actually, I think personality is one of the, the best thing inventions in history because it means that at least everybody is not a commodity, right? If we're digging ditches, digging ditches is totally a commodity. But being Chad, not a commodity. Yeah. Um, all of those analogies, uh, really should strike a chord with so many people that, that are either watching or listening. The, the, my mom makes Mac and cheese and your mom makes Mac and cheese. I mean, that, that's just it. And if you can put yourself in the position of I am mom, which means there is no one right. Figuratively, there is no one better than I am Mm -hmm. at and making this dish and by dish, whatever your product or service is, then, then you could charge more because the people that are in your community will be happy to pay it as long as they get their, your attention Mm -hmm. on their problem, right? Your solution to to their problem. Yes. Um, it, that's very well said. You know, I can't help. And, and for those that are listening, uh, you should probably go to the YouTube channel to, to check this out because behind, behind Perry, um, you will see um, hundreds of books and, um, and Perry is, is an esteemed author. And I do have a question about, about that, about you, you being an author and you becoming an author. Yeah. Um, similar to my question of, well, when did, you know, when did you turn to the dark side? Uh, um, when it comes to marketing, at what point did, did you decide, you know what, I've learned from some of the best marketers on the planet. I've studied them. I've implemented their techniques. I've had success. Now I'm putting my own spin on things and it's time for me to share that with the world. Why was it so important for you to finally write a book? So this really started when I, I hung out my shingle um, as, as an independent consultant. And I still have very fond memories of what it was like because I had longed to get out on my own for so long. It's like, I am a freelancer. Like, I don't have to go to an office. Like, I was just exhilarated. But the funny thing is, is it's, it really surprised me how quickly that became normal. And now my ambitions jumped to the next thing. And the next thing was, I don't want to just punch the clock and do project work. I want to sell my intellectual property. Um, I had studied information marketing and it just appealed to me. It was like, yeah, like I, I want to do my own spin on things. So so I, was, I published a, a, a free audio CD called Guerrilla Marketing for High-Tech Salespeople. And then I made an info product, which was basically for B2B technical uh, like marketing stuff. And, and so that, w- that was where I, I cut my teeth. Now, what I think would be an interesting like answer to your question, um, uh, uh, the next part was, uh, so a year goes by and I have been experimenting with Google ads and Google was brand new. Like I think the AdWords program started in February of 2002 and in April I discovered it and I was using it and I was kind of bemused that nobody else seemed to realize how big of a deal this was. 
I was like, this is the coolest thing I have ever seen in my life. In fact, I'm not sure if I even want to tell people about it because this is so cool. This is like my, my fishing hole. Well, I, I was talking to Ken McCarthy and one thing led to another and he goes, Perry, I think you should speak at my seminar on Google AdWords. And so I accepted the invitation. Well, as soon as I accepted the invitation, I knew I was suddenly in a new business, which I figured would last six months. I had no idea that Google was gonna like take over the world. It, would, it was probably unimaginable then, but I knew, so I've gotta have something I can sell when I go speak because they don't pay you in this business to go speak. And so I wrote this book called The Definitive Guide to Google AdWords. And, and again, that was just so I had something to sell when I spoke, but um, we started selling it as an ebook and it, it went supernova, like, cause Google went supernova and affiliate marketing went supernova. And about three years later, I realized if I don't get this in the bookstores, somebody's going to beat me to it. And there, there was another thing that happened right at that time that hugely affected this decision. Um, I had a, a, a friend make me a Wikipedia page because I believe that I deserve to be on Wikipedia. And it was like, well, I'm a famous marketing guy and everybody in marketing knows who I am and I'm selling this book. And about two days later, the Wikipedia gets, page gets this thing on the front and it says, this appears to be a vanity entry by a non-notable person please add suitable references or this page will be deleted. I had no suitable references. I was all over the blogosphere. I was all over internet marketing. There was not one single magazine, newspaper, television show, book, or anything. And the page got taken down. It's like, okay, Perry, you might be a legend in your own mind and you might be a legend in some little cult weird corner of the world that nobody understands, but you are still nobody. <laughs> and, and I decided I need to get a publisher. And I basically gave a six figure book, uh, like ebook business to a publisher. And I traded money for credibility, uh, which became the Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords, which is now in, uh, coming into its sixth edition. Um, and, and because I knew if the mainstream world does not take you seriously, you will eventually get taken out. And how long did you have to write that initial ebook from the time you were asked to speak at the event to the time you delivered your talk? I had about two months, maybe three. Um, so I, I had the invitation, I gave the talk and I said, it wasn't quite ready, but it was like, this will be mailed out within the next 30 days. And I was just furiously Hustling. doing this. And I had a, I had a conversation with, it was actually with Matt Fury. Um, because there was another guy who had named Andrew Goodman, who had a Google book. Andrews was literally the first book on Google ads. It was actually pretty good. And I was telling Matt about this, that I had the speaking invitation and Matt goes, so what if somebody else has a book? You've got a different take on it than they do. You write a book. Now, of course I was concerned with first mover advantage and all that, but what Matt realized that I only discovered as I like went, put one foot in front of the other was I had a very different take on the subject than Andrew. Um, and my approach didn't invalidate his and his didn't invalidate mine. Um, as you know, there can be many ways to approach a subject, but I had a very particular viewpoint, including being an electrical engineer. Okay. Now there's no electrical engineering in these books, except there is like, it's a process. Like you build a chemical plant, like the chemicals come in on one end and the refined oil comes out on the other end, or you make plastic pellets or clicks come in and, you know, they search for stuff and then they come to your website and all this stuff. 
it's all the same thing and it's all numbers. And so I actually find that, that engineers and people with science and technical backgrounds have a very definite place in marketing. You know, you may or may not be a copywriter, you may or may not be a this or that, but if you, if you think people are interesting, if you think psychology is interesting, and you have skills with, oh, there is definitely a place for you in this world. I can second that as a, and those listening don't know this yet, but I was an engineer for Lockheed Martin. Oh, uh, well, yeah. we're, we, well, I'm buying <laughs> you a beer. <laughs> uh, not, not electrical. It was more IT, but, um, but I absolutely see, um, I, I know that my training in that um, and my knack for that uh, engineering has has made the the marketing that we do for for our businesses, um, you know, accelerate for sure. Well, I'll, I'll even add that. So I'm in the sales rep job. It's a poor match for me. I'm I eventually got fired, but I got I've got this Dan Kennedy stuff. Dan's stuff was the first sales training that really, really, really made sense to me, and it was because he he put a sales pitch on a piece of paper and the piece of paper was linear. And it was like, so you have a headline, you have an opening paragraph, you have, you, you problem agitate, solve, you have a call to action, you have a guarantee. I remember one day I was a sales call. I think I was at Ford Motor Company or something. And it suddenly snapped into place. Perry, you realize that instead of just walking in here and like talking to these guys about whatever it occurs to you to think about, if you go in there and you give them a headline and an opening paragraph and you problem agitate solve and, and make some kind of a promise and a USP and a guarantee, like that is exactly what you should be doing every time you go out and talk to somebody. And, and now that I had a picture of it in my mind, it all started to make sense. And I actually started to be able to sell too and not just be a marketer. Yeah, because you have the framework. Yeah. Um, so I, I often talk about how, how marketing is a science and an art. Um, it, you know, we know that you dive deep into the science part of that um, you know, with the math and you know, 80-20 goes into that, into that in a big way. And I urge everyone to go, uh, especially uh, check, out, check out that book. Um, and, then, and then if you want to do Facebook or Google, um, or anything else, like get, go deeper with Perry. Um, as, as we round the corner here, and, and I wish we had another hour, maybe we'll do it an, another time. Um, I've, I've got three questions for you. And, you know, actually, as I'm going through my cards here, um, I'm going to start with this one. As I see, you've got a ton of books behind you. Unlike me, I just have toys uh, but behind <laughs> me. Um, my, my bookshelf is on the other side of the room, though. Uh, name, name a book. Uh, I just want to stick with books here. What's one book that that you love uh, and why that, that you think would, would be useful for, for those that, that want to learn more about, about online and di digital marketing? Well, I think one of the books that I love the most is the book of Proverbs in the Bible. And there's a very particular reason why, and it's because there are, there are two completely different categories of mistakes that people make in business. So one category is strategic and tactical mistakes. You bought it into apartment complexes at totally the wrong time and you and your investors all took a bath, right? Or you're an idiot and you don't know how to do inventory or, you know, whatever, okay? Strategical and tactical mis mistakes. And those are mistakes that people will eventually forgive you for <laughs> okay it might take them two years might take them five years but sooner or later okay you lost the investors money yeah well buy guns be buy guns but <clears throat> people generally do not forgive you for mistakes of moral failure okay uh, or or like gross negligence or or um, or greed like the Enron guys you know even if they didn't go to jail they're on the run forever 
like because they screwed people out of their retirement money and they were willfully stupid and arrogant, right? That's like a completely different thing. The book of Proverbs is about not making those kind of mistakes. Um, my experience is that if your personal integrity and your trustworthiness is really good, your tactic and strategy can be merely okay. And you will still be a perfectly respected person, right? But I think the most dangerous people are the brilliant ones who ha they have the tactics and strategy all figured out, but they, they lack the principles and the moral goodness. And th those people, like, they're going 900 miles an hour with their hair on fire and everything looks great and everything's growing. And then like they slam into brick walls and sometimes it's irreparable. So that's, it's a, it's a great book. It's 31 chapters that you can read a chapter a day for a month and you'll be probably 10 times more resilient when you finish. Who is one person that inspires you? top of the stack um the guy named james shapiro uh he's a friend of mine he's he's actually my mentor in the evolution space which is a whole nother i have a whole career as a scientist that we don't have to get into here but um i was um nasim nicholas taleb says that one of the signs that a contrarian scientist might be worth listening to, uh, this he says this in Skin in the Game, which is a great book. He says one of the signs that maybe you should be listening to a scientist is if they've paid a personal price for the positions that they have taken, but they've stuck, like they've stuck to their convictions. And um, Jim... Jim has basically taken a viewpoint that living things are like cells are brilliant little engineers and that they have, they possess uh, like a sort of intelligence um, that's, you know, that's unique and, and even maybe in certain ways, just smarter than smarter than we are. And, you know, that, that viewpoint has actually started to come in vogue in, in the last five years. But if you rewind 10, 15, 20 years ago, man, that was a, that was a tough row to hoe. And, you know, I know a lot of people like that. And so, you, you know, you asked me to name one person. Um, I really admire people who are vindicated by time and who, who take positions on things that are initially unpopular. I think that's a very admirable thing. Name a cool tool or an app or an extension, uh, something that you're using right now. Um, perrymarshall.com slash grade is a copywriting tool where you can take any piece of copy, paste it in, click a button, It'll tell you the flesh Kincaid grade level, the reading level of the text. It'll tell you how many words in your text and it'll give you the me to you ratio in the copy. So how many times are you using you and your and that kind of language and talking to the reader about themselves and how many times are you saying me and my and we and our and it actually gives you a ratio and the ratio typically should be better than two to one. You should, you should be talking about your reader at least twice as much as you're talking about yourself. And even if you are talking about yourself, you should still implicitly be talking about your reader because they should be going, that guy is so much like me, it's not even funny. And then you're still talking about them because copy is always about the reader. I love that. Perry, how can people learn more about you? How can they follow along? I suggest that you go to, to sell8020.com. 
you can buy 80, 20 sales and marketing for a penny plus shipping, which is seven bucks, which is about 10 or 12 bucks cheaper than it is on Amazon. And 80, 20 sales and marketing will change your life. I know people say that I'm completely serious. It will, it, if you, if you go read the reviews there, I it's got about 600 ratings on Amazon. Um, you'll people go, Oh my goodness, this was like, I never saw the world this way before now. And suddenly it's everywhere. Absolutely. Um, and I've read those reviews and I've read the book, uh, and, and can attest, um, Harry, thanks so much uh, for taking the time and coming on the marketing on demand show. Thank you, Chad. It was a pleasure. And I want to send everyone that is watching or listening my marketing on demand method for free. So just visit marketingondemand.com or text the word method to 90851 and we'll get it right over to you. Hey, real quick. If you enjoyed this episode, please let me know by rating this podcast and leaving me an honest review. If you found this episode useful for your business, take a screenshot and tag me on Instagram at chadcollins.me and use hashtag marketing on demand. That way I'll be able to see it and repost it. I also created a guide of the top 40 ways people are using marketing on demand strategies and tactics in their businesses. And I want you to have it for free. Just text guide, G-U-I-D-E to 90851 and I'll get it right over to you on demand. Until next time, I'm Chad Evan Collins, and this has been the Marketing On Demand Show.